hear from two people in the know on uh, what trade policy is all about in Australia and New Zealand from a bit more perhaps of a diplomatic perspective or... Um, and so we crowdsourced some questions, three questions, and uh, to keep it light, we're um, doing one question and then uh, quick fire answers from both our guests. Um, so there'll be three questions, three minutes each. So we should be done very quickly and then you'll be back doing your networking. So it really gives me great pleasure to um, introduce Amy Giho, who's the Australian Deputy High Commissioner to New Zealand. She's over 20 years experience in the Australian Public Service and is an experienced trade negotiator. She's had various roles in Canberra and overseas, participated in free trade agreement negotiations and supported industries to expand their export opportunities. Nicole Roberton is the Divisional Manager for the Australian Division at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade here in New Zealand. She has previously served as Divisional Manager for the Southeast Asia Division and the UN Human Rights and Commonwealth Division. And she's also served as a New Zealand Ambassador and a Foreign Policy Consultant. So please join with me in um, welcoming our distinguished guests. So, Amy, over to you with question one. The World Trade Organization-based multilateral trading system is widely viewed as facing existential challenges, despite the partially successful ministerial meeting in Geneva last year. What do you see as the most serious threat to the WTO, and what potential do you think there is for progress in the WTO? Thanks. Uh, I think the second part is quite challenging, but the first part is a bit easier, and we heard a lot of that already today. Um, in my view, I think there's kind of two main factors um, that, have, that have come about um, with the WTO now. The first one is a bit more relevant to me, and it's around complacency. I think when I started working in the trade space, the WTO was working. It was working for everyone. The rules were set. People were largely following them. If they weren't following them, you had a dispute system that you could take your disputes to. And when you were found to not have complied, generally uh, countries would fix those rules. Um, so it worked. And it's only been over the, the most recent period where it started to fall away a little bit. And a lot of people, I think, um, probably used to question the value of the WTO. What did it ever do for us? Um, I think now, now that we see the system starting to break, we understand the importance of it, but probably we didn't always. And the second part, I think, um, we heard from Shiro this morning about some of these big issues. Um, the, the biggest countries in the world, the biggest economies in the world, um, aren't necessarily following the rules of the WTO, or the rules haven't been set up in a way that forces compliance and fairness for others. Um, so Shiro talked about the US and China situation, but there are others in there as well. I mean, the EU um, likes to make the rules fit for their purpose, which doesn't necessarily mean they fit our purpose. Um, India um, will only abide by the rules if it suits their purpose as well, and otherwise they, they tend to not follow the rules. So there's lots of countries in there that aren't following the rules, or the rules aren't fit to help um, address the concerns that we have. So I can understand why the US has gone down the path it has with disruption to the dispute settlement body. It wasn't delivering for the US and others the way it should have been, and it probably needs reform. And disruption is probably a good thing. We need to have that in the WTO because there is a lot of uh, negotiation that happens and has happened in the same way, in the same manner, and people have just bedded down into their um, positions and not tried to actually resolve issues Second part of it, um, how do you solve it? <laughs> um, well, I, th I think countries like Australia and New Zealand, we can't walk away from this system. It is vital to us. It's vital to us as free and open trading nations. We need to continue to demonstrate the value of the WTO to us and to others. Um, but then I was thinking about during the digital session, um, which was great, by the way, because um, digital trade is something that I really need to learn a bit more about. But, but I was thinking more about AI and, you know, maybe, maybe we could have some kind of AI disruption in the WTO that, that negotiates for us and sees what the, what the artificial intelligence might solve. I don't know, crazy idea. <laughs> Nicole. 
Kia ora. Great to see everybody here. It's nice to be sitting down and watching you all stand up. It's, it feels backwards. Um, I haven't got much to add to what Amy said in, in terms of the uh, challenges to the system. They've been pretty heavily canvassed today, and, and they're really serious. Um, <clears throat> as a small nation, and this is just true for the WTO, it's also true for the wider UN system, um, we're particularly um, hard hit when the international rules are, are, um, are under attack. And I think um, I'm not defeatist on this. I, I do think there's a lot to be said for leaning in and um, I think I worry to the point about complacency if we say oh the whole multilateral trading system's in trouble and we we can't walk away. We just can't afford to walk away. So we have to lean in. Doing the work on FTAs, on plurilateral arrangements is all really important as well in terms of keeping that tonality of of um, uh, trading together still going because you know we are in a moment of so many countries looking inwards and that's really dangerous. So working with countries like Australia with so many like-minded to basically keep that, that norm going, that actually um, having a rules-based system, no matter how you manage your rules-based system, is just hugely important. And I think that's why this bilateral relationship is really important because we share that between us, the importance of those rules. Kia ora. So question two, I'm gonna to come to you first, Nicole. So research that we conducted here at the PPI last year showed that many Australians see New Zealand as an important destination for tourism and trade, but very few knew about the trade agreements we both share. So we're going to be repeating the study here in New Zealand and we anticipate similar findings. So given the growing, growing emphasis on inclusive trade and trade for all, what do you think is needed to increase the knowledge of and trust in multilateral agreements? I think we've just had a really important presentation, including for the Minister, about um, how important it is to understand, that communities understand the, the value of trade agreements for them. Um, it's, it's really the trade for all agenda that um, is being pursued now is really about explaining to, to New Zealanders how much they benefit from trade and also hearing back in reverse um, how trade negotiations need to be evolved so that they really represent communities. Um, it's going to be really interesting now just thinking about Cyclone Gabriel and, and the impact, the climate change piece, the infrastructure piece. It's actually, I think, a really important moment to talk about how what the Im economic impacts of, of all of these massive events are for all of us and how that will play into the impact uh, for New Zealand's economy and how important it is that what trade agreements can do to help New Zealand recover and, and for all countries to recover. And that, that's not something abstract that happens in a room somewhere in Geneva or whatever. It's something that affects everybody's lives. Um, with respect to something like CER, I would imagine the average person on the street really doesn't know that CER exists. Um, but if you were, and we've talked about this in terms of doing a comms program for people around, the, it's, this year is the 40th anniversary of CER, and if you were to sort of do a counterfactual and take away every benefit that derives to the person on the street from CER, it would be brutal. Yeah. Um, and we don't do a great job of actually explaining that to people. Um, you know, it's possibly not the sexiest thing, but actually it affects everybody's lives every day, yeah. um, and particularly the relationship with Australia, because we, are, we have a, a completely integrated economy, and it's not something we explain enough, and, and we were going to lean into that this year. Oh, kia ora. Amy. Thanks. I'll just start and note that the fact that we don't know the trade agreement is there is also a sign that it's quite effective in its operation. It's seamless, and that's the way a trade agreement is meant to be. You only know when a trade agreement doesn't work when it impacts your life. And so I think it's a, it's a sign of a good trade agreement and the best trade agreement we've got that it's seamless. It's been in there a long time, and we've spent a long time making it seamless through various interactions, but, but it is the best trade agreement that we've got, and it's valuable to both Australia and New Zealand. Um, in terms of... Um, you know, where to next? I think Nicole um, hit the nail on the head in terms of sustainable and inclusive trade. It is a focus um, for the new Australian government um, to have a First Nations foreign policy and as part of that to talk about how um, we can work better with our Indigenous Australians to help them trade more effectively, to consult with them on trade agreements, similar to what we saw in the video at the last session. Um, we need to learn from New Zealand in those experiences as well. So, Kia ora. So our final question for the evening. Amy, I'm going to come to you first. What do you see as the most significant benefit of the CER trade agreement for the Australian and New Zealand economies over the last 40 years? 
and then what is needed in the next 40 years to develop and future-proof CER to meet those economic challenges and the desire for environmentally sustainable trade. I think the biggest benefit I just touched on before, it's the fact that it's, it has enabled that seamless economic integration between Australia and New Zealand. Um, there is room to improve and to build on this, and there's, there's a, been a series of work that's happened over the last several years through our um, single economic market that we've been working on. The Australian New Zealand Leadership Forum has been working with to bring forward business ideas to that as well, and we need to keep that work going. Um, we touched on before sustainable and inclusive trade is an area of focus for us going forward too. But the other thing that we can do uh, is work together in other settings to show the benefits um, of free and open trade. So we're doing work in the WTO and in the OECD around agricultural subsidies and linking that um, harmful agricultural subsidies that are harmful to environmental ob um, obligations. So. Um, if, we, if we all want to um, address the climate crisis, we can't be unsustainably subsidising agricultural production as well. Mm -hmm. So there's work we can do together um, globally as well. Kia ora. Maybe just to sort of add a few points on the where we're going next. Um, I'm actually really, really passionate about the point that we talk about CER as being the gold standard, but we need to, again, to steal the word of complacency, be quite careful with CER because... Um, there is, there is still so much more to do. We, we've talked to ANZ LF. I was with Prime Minister Hipkins um, in Australia, gosh, two weeks ago now, and the room was full of... We had really serious heavy hitters from the Australian um, business community in that room, um, all of whom were saying issues like regulatory alignment, banking systems, digital services, you name it, there are ongoing things that, that, that still, you know, the behind the border issues, which actually do really affect commerce. And so um, I sort of think of CER as being like a, a shark, you know, it's got to keep moving. We can't just tick the box and say we're done um, and then move on. There's actually, it's perpetual work and this, the single economic market work that all the different agencies do with each other across the Tasman is a, a hugely important part of that. Um, to the point about what we do, you know, um, in the broader scheme, one of the discussions we're having in-house at the moment, particularly on the sustainable and inclusive issues, is a lot of these things are being discussed in plurilateral and multilateral fora as well. Is it something that we do just bilaterally between the two of us? Is it something that we do um, perhaps through, you know, IPF or pick your, your um, plurilateral agreement? But I think the, the real value of Australia and New Zealand together is that because we can have a very high level of ambition is actually to stick with that kind of gold standard piece and maybe between us um, either agree bilaterally and certainly work together in, in, um, in third context to really lift the bar on that stuff. And again, I'll come back to Cyclone Gabriel and those kinds of things and the expectations of community that we work um, in terms of sustainable and inclusive trade in terms of Indigenous are really high and there's an obligation on, on, on us as, as officials to really deliver that for communities. So there's a lot to do still in CER and, and this year, the 40th anniversary year, we'll be leading into that pretty hard. Fabulous. So you're putting a lot of work out there onto these fabulous young people to be doing in the next 40 years. And on that note, I'd like you to ask, um, I'd like to ask you to join with me in thanking our two distinguished guests and then return to your uh, nourishment. <laughs>